Hi everybody, I'm Gus Agarella of the Dire Gentleman channel, and this is my friend Henry Galley, and we're about to read a list of Twitter rules so that you don't have to. Yes, that is exactly why we're here. Um, just for quick context, we'll keep this intro short. Uh, Lily Orchard, a very controversial YouTuber, posted and then promptly deleted a list of, I think, 101 pieces of writing advice on Twitter, and... The thing is, you'll get a lot of people sort of talking conjecture about this stuff, but Gus and I, we're professional writers, we've written on various projects before, our current one is the Less Is Morgue podcast, which you can go out and find to tell us we're either good or shit, depending on your tastes. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if we, if we play our cards well enough on this one, there will be an hour-long video prepared about how our podcast is garbage, and here's why. And frankly, I cannot wait. So, we're gonna jump right into this. Uh, I've read these before, but Gus never has. So what I'm gonna do is read these out to Gus, and we're actually gonna discuss each of these uh, pieces on their merits as actual writing advice as people who work in the field professionally. So if you're an aspiring writer, we hope you can get something out of this video. Yeah, and just one last addendum. I have not heard these, and I am going to give Lily the benefit of the doubt going into this. I'm going to go in pretty open-minded because I've followed her content in the past and uh, gotten something out of it. I think that she makes some salient points occasionally. But I guess that's all the buttering up of whatever we're about to see that's going to happen. <laughs> This is uh, in the false interest of needing to appear even-handed. <laughs> no, it's it's not false. I honestly, some <laughs> of her content is uh, is is pretty enjoyable and good. Um, but I am deeply conflicted about the, like Lily Orchard's overall presence on the internet. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. But that's not why we're here today. Let's talk about writing. Are you ready to begin, Gus? Beam me up. Give me advice. I'm a novice writer. I've never written anything. These are lies. But but f for the bit. Give me, give me the first advice. Tip number one, and each I imagine will be on the screen as uh, I read them. Number one, don't worry about spoilers. If your story is good, spoilers aren't going to make it any less enjoyable. If spoilers make a story less enjoyable, that just means you are relying on cheap shock value as a shortcut. That's just not writing advice. Yo, yeah, that's, that's blatantly, like, reaction to writing advice. That's, that, that, yeah, that has nothing to do with stories. Yeah, so if you're a writer starting a new project, um, don't even think about that. Why, why would you? It doesn't matter. Yeah, like, I think I think that, in principle, I agree with that, that, like, yes. statement. But yeah. I don't think it's writing advice. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Point number two. The middle of a story is the best time to get a main couple together. Are you working on a five-season show? Put your main couple together halfway through season three. The finale is the worst time because we don't get any time to enjoy the payoff. What are your thoughts, Gus? Honestly, I agree that more shows should get their couples together earlier on. Yeah, like, I think if writers are given the freedom to do that, I think that one's okay. Yeah, I mean, my attitude towards it is, it's a kind of thing where there shouldn't be a blanket rule on this. Because, yes, some relationships, I think, in media, you're like... I wish that had a little bit more time to breathe and enjoy it. And especially if you're someone who comes from kind of a shipping perspective, I can see why if, like, it was your whole reason for being invested in something. If it's just, like, a last note at the end, that would annoy you. But at the same time, there were a lot of incredible romantic comedies. Take, for example, my favourite romantic comedy, uh, When Harry Met Sally, written by Nora Ephron. Um... That makes excellent use of a, like, a will-they-won't-they they thing throughout, and a genuinely, like, heartwarming final payoff that I think we just wouldn't have if that same beat happened earlier in the story. Yeah, I guess to play devil's advocate here, I just want to give two pieces of context. One, I think that this happens infrequent enough in media, like, it's usually will-they-won't-they they, that, like, I understand advocating for more stories to use the, like couple hooks up secondly we got to keep in mind this is lily orchard and this all applies to children's cartoons mostly i know but at the end of the day it's writing advice and we need to discuss the larger implications well yeah 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 no the second one is not by any means an excuse it's a uh context that yeah is a clear a clear thing in like one genre may not apply to the whole of writing absolutely so i think what i'd say is i think what we'll do throughout this thing and feel free to cut this in post is um if need be, we'll give our version 
of each rating thing at the end of our discussion on it. Oh no, that's a that's a good thing. We're definitely keeping that in because I wanna I wanna do that for a few of these. Excellent, because I'm thinking this: make the payoff of your romance the middle part of the story, if that's right for your story. Yeah, yeah. I think well, I think that's gonna be the big caveat for all of this. It's like you yeah. don't have to. You don't have to. You you like writing is uh very like flexible, and you do yeah. what suits the the thing you're trying to tell. Um, uh, next one. Number three is. Friends to lovers is better than enemies to lovers. Every time. Every time? Again, yeah, it's just a a needless blanket statement, because the fact is, if someone says, I prefer friends to lovers to enemies to lovers every time, perfectly justifiable. But the fact is, there are great and there are terrible examples of both. Yeah, yeah, I think... Every time is the is the one that's a problem here, because if you didn't say that, it's just like, oh, well, you have preference to this kind of trope. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. And I mean, that is, to be honest, spoilers, a uh, running sort of thing with this list as a whole. There is a real issue of just uh, presenting preferences as this is something that you would be better off doing. Now listen, I made a big uh, video on She-Ra at one point, and I guarantee that this part of the list was, like, this rule was particularly made to go after She-Ra and Katra's relationship. Because I, I would expect such a thing from Lily. But I would have to say that Katra and She-Ra are both friends to lovers and enemies to lovers. They're friends before they're enemies, so like... There's some nuance here that just is getting completely ignored. Yeah, and again, I'm sorry to tell you this, Gus. A lot of these are going to be about She-Ra. Are you kidding me? I am so ready to defend She-Ra, the show that I uh, uh, did not sleep through the second half of, but still enjoyed. Absolutely. All right, so I guess to close on that one is friends to lovers, enemies to lovers, see what works for your characters and your story. Yes. (laughs) Like, (laughs) it's not rocket science. Okay. Yeah. Are you ready for number four? All right. Victims of abuse moving away from the negative impacts of their abuse, i.e. Zuko, and becoming healthier are not redemption arcs. I get this isn't advice. Wait, okay, I think that's just semantics, honestly, because... Yeah. Zuko... Zuko is a story about redemption. Like, his path is about redemption. Is this... Is this just because redemption is a dirty word to Lily? Yeah, and also, I think this is a nuance that's really worth saying. It's not a writing thing, it's just a life thing. But, like, while it definitely doesn't always happen, probably doesn't even happen half of the time, people who are abused can still be abusers. Because the actual abuse that happens to Zuko doesn't preclude what he does, yeah. Again, at the end of the day, like... It just has no business being on this list. It, it's it's not writing advice. Yeah. It is, as you said, pure semantics. Well, yeah, exactly. And that's why I like want to say uh, my addendum to this rule would be don't let any particular word, be it redemption or deconstruction or subversive, define your entire like body of work by your like either adulation or hatred for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Next. Number five. Heroes refusing to kill villains who have shown to be actively trying to murder people isn't noble, it's enabling. I'm going to actually say that I agree with this in principle. However, I, I, I would prefer it to be in like more adult stories because I don't think a lot of kids are going to understand that. <laughs> I think my addendum to this, to be honest, is even in the context of children's things... This is a, um, this is an, sort of an unconstructively binary way to look at things, because I, I, I can see why you would think this if your only frame of reference for all media was Steven Universe, but there are things between become friends with and kill. Like, th- there, are these, there are these buildings that exist called jails where murderers go. <laughs> Okay, but here's my actual hot take on this, and it's that the finale of Avatar The Last Airbender, in which Aang gets, like, a magical power to depower the Fire Lord, I think that that is 
literally the worst moment of writing in the entire series. Uh, uh, only topped by the fact that he awakens all of his chakras by getting a random rock jabbed in his back moments ago, you know, instead of rigorous spiritual training. I think there's something to be said in that particular case study of one of the most celebrated shows of all time that, yeah, that was kind of a cop-out ending. However, I don't think this is universal basically like all of these other tips. This is not universal. This is like something you'd have to break down piece by piece when it comes to a case study for something. But since Avatar came to my mind, that's where I kind of agree with it, where it's like there's some shows that could manage to do something a little bit more nuanced rather than just like letting the villain live for, for the sake of the audience. Oh, no, absolutely. And the thing is, I don't want to engage with any of these points in bad faith, but um, the fact is that, that like... It isn't just the bar, like the barony, <laughs> the, the barony of it all. <laughs> it isn't just the binary between, like, and again, I think this comes as a negative sound effect of basically purely consuming children's media. Is that it isn't just the choice between make happy friends with and murder? Like, people can be like imprisoned. Or have other forms of, like, punishment or defeat. Like, you know, again, this is obviously a, a type of storytelling that I have other problems with. But, you know, Batman, when he catches the villains, doesn't just, you know, let them go again. Do you know what I mean? Just as a principle of, you can be a I don't kill people guy, while still not actively allowing the villains to murder more people. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, the whole, the extent to which Batman will take I don't kill is like memefied yeah, no. to death. Oh, but, yeah. But, but, and also the other reason why the villains have to live is for comic book reasons. So, again, different mediums, different types of stories, uh, all of this is going to throw this wildly into flux. Um, so, as it stands, this point, this point, it seems almost like vague posting about specific shows, but like, it can't quite make the leap to being a universal writing tip? No, exactly, exactly. It's um, it's that variation on the golden rule where it's like, um, only allow yourself to perform an action if performing that action was made a general principle didn't lead to the collapse of society. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think we can say that with this because the reality is it's too, it's too nuanced for this rule to really have any value. Um, look at your story, look at your villain, look at your hero, look at the consequences. Like, be flexible about it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, next. Uh, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, six. Two women kissing in the last episode of a show after four to five seasons of trying to murder each other isn't revolutionary. It's fetishized abuse and violence. Uh, this is just She-Ra. This is just like, I didn't like the ending of She-Ra, so no show can ever do what it did. Yeah, again, I think it's deeply frustrating that, like, this is framed as writing advice, and it's like, okay, wonderful, I will make sure not to have my two leads kiss at the end of three to five seasons uh, <laughs> of them fighting. <laughs> Did I did I say did I say vague posting earlier? Because this is just vague posting. Yeah, I mean the thing is, what I think what people need to understand about abuse is that a fiction and reality are different things, and there are naturally just different rules and principles. Fiction is heightened to a degree that re reality isn't. But I feel like what's most important is it becomes abuse if the trying to murder each other continues. After they enter the relationship. Yeah, and also I just want to say, and like, I can't believe I have to get deep into this, but the Shira and Adora themselves, sure, they they like were pitted against each other, but their relationship was no more abusive than, say, uh, Gamora and Nebula from the Marvel films, where it's like there's clearly an authority figure that forced them into this certain situation. And with Gamora and Nebula, they choose to be sisters. With She-Ra and Adora, they choose to, like, find love and care in each other's arms. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that just because of the unfortunate circumstances of their life up until that point. It seems kind of weird to prevent them from finding happiness in any way. Yeah, we, we, we need to put a, um, a spoiler tag at the start of this video. 
<laughs> Lily started it. Lily started it. These are all spoilers, it's, as far as I'm true, concerned. It, it's it's another <laughs> but thing. But we can't where care we was... about that. Rule number one. No, it's true. It's true. But um, yeah, r- realistically, this this isn't a writing rule. It, it's vague posting. This is so specific that it's not in any way applicable to works people are creating right now. Yeah, I think that the other thing is that, like, Korra and Asami not kissing was a big problem to Lily, and then the characters kiss, and it's like, no, no, don't. Again, needs to be said that, like, if ever it seems like we're engaging uh, on a point like this in bad faith or not going deep enough into it, it's because, uh, in some ways, elements of this list are quite repetitive, and I know for a fact that stuff like Enemies to Lovers will come up again later. Oh no. Oh no. So uh oh, we'll no. we'll get to that when we get to it. <laughs> oh lord. Number 7. Twitter is not an appropriate place to reveal story details. The appropriate place is in the work itself. Okay, so that is a piece of advice for JJ Abrams and JJ Abrams only. If you're JJ Abrams and you're listening to this, You've been told. <laughs> no, okay, that's also a place for the Russo brothers and Darren Nefsey and uh, J.K. Rowling and so many other people. I think that I unambiguously agree with this one. Don't put, like, your lore on, on Twitter. That's not the story. Don't do it. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I was being unnecessarily harsh. You're right. That That is a problem. Sorry, Lily. Mea culpa. Um, this is why I'm here, sure. to be the, the, the devil today. The devil's advocate. Shall, shall we move to number eight? Uh, yes, I jab you with my pitchfork. <laughs> Again, th- this is one that I'm slightly going to engage with in bad faith, but only because it's funny. I'm just I'm just laying my cards on the table okay, there. Okay, fair enough. When a character's body count is over 10,000 innocent lives, then that character is no longer redeemable. Uh, what I love about like this rule is again this is engaging in bad faith but you killed 9999 people there's hope for you yet that oh my god that's exactly bad faith uh, I'm laying my cards out on the table here I'm not being one of those annoying YouTube people who pretends what I've just said is a legitimate point because it is not it's a joke I'm not being an ER here this is explicitly a joke not a legitimate point I, and I also just wanted to say that I can think of one character from a movie that I really like whose body count uh, is up there, but they still end up deserving redemption. Now, granted, they don't... Is it Colossal? <sighs> it's a complicated... Uh, yes, yes. Everybody go watch Colossal. It's my favorite movie of all time. I, I think what I want to say about this rule in terms of an actual good faith argument is that, like, philosophically, this is very much the, like, you know, you place a grain of sand on the ground, you place another grain of sand on the ground, when does it become a pile of sand? Like, this is a thing where it's so dependent on so many other factors in the work you're creating, like, tone, context, all that, like, can I, can I give a, an example personal to us? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Slow spoilers, but again, the fact that we're professional writers is probably why you're listening to this in the first place, because we're coming at this from a place of authority. Um, in our show, Less is Morgue, the character, uh, Riley, eats a completely innocent dude in episode one, and is kind of a dick about it. And over time, we kind of get, like, Riley getting better about this kind of thing, and, like, killing people less. But in the tone and atmosphere we create for the show, it's clear that this doesn't carry the same weight as, say, someone killing someone else in, like, a serious primetime drama. No, absolutely. Like, horror comedy is sort of the tone we're going for, and I think that you know, through that lens, people have understood it as such and not, re- like, realize that, you know, they're not actually listening to a show about someone who resembles a real-life murderer. Exactly, and I think that's what I'm trying to say here. I think the issue with this rule is just the fact that, like, it, it, it's a rule that doesn't really have a right to be considered a rule. And I want to say later on, just because um, Lily says it at the very end, these are tips, not rules, but uh, we're still here to discuss them. But, um, but again, I just don't want to be doing anything in bad faith here, you know? This should really just be called the the diamond rule, because this is just directly about the diamonds in Steven Universe. Oh, which, no. I will say, I will say, the tone of that show just doesn't accommodate the actions of the diamonds. And I think that's the big problem, is that it tries to have its cake 
and also set a house on fire. And it's like, we came for cake. But no, that's the thing. That's what I think we should take away from this rule. It's the fact that, like, whether this rule is right for you depends on some questions you have to ask yourself about the story you're telling. Yes, exactly. What is the tone here? Like, what, what, like, what is the context? What is the genre? Like, this is the question you should be asking yourself. To be honest, if straight away your first question is, should I redeem this villain or not? you're already kind of putting the cart before the horse. Yeah, well, if you're thinking about your story in terms of, like, how it compares to the tropes of other stories and, like, how you can defy the mechanics of, like, other uh, pre-existing fiction, then I don't think you're making it a personal process. I think you're making it a process of, like, well, I can do what they didn't, and that'll make my story what I would have wanted. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's like, you're kind of missing some of the fun there. So, you know, just... Yeah. Don't worry about this and cross this bridge when you get to it after really asking questions about what kind of story you're telling here. Exactly. All right, next, next one. Tip. All right, number nine. Tip eight does not apply to characters for whom making them the villain was a stupid, idiotic idea. I don't know who this is, but i.e. Sylvanas Windrunner. At that point, it's just character <laughs> re-realment. Okay, okay. So this is just Lily being like, okay, I know what I just said, but this doesn't apply to my favorite character because they're my fave. Like, that's actually what this rule is. That's hilarious. There's nothing else to this. This is where editing comes in. You look at your previous rule... And then you think of an exception to it, and you're like, hmm, maybe this rule isn't universal. Maybe I should not include this rule. Yeah. <laughs> because if one of your favorite characters in storytelling is an obvious exception, then it's not universal. And in fact, like, you are encouraging people not to create things that you enjoy. We, we shouldn't even waste time on this. It's not a rule. It's a vague post. Look at that. It's not even a vague post. She says the fucking name. All right. Ten. Ten. Everything in a story is there because the creator wished it to be there. Trying to explain away bigoted story decisions using world building is a fallacy because you put it there to begin with. Well, yeah, that's the Thermian paradox, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, generally. I, I, yeah, I have no problems with that. that. That one's fine. Yeah, everything in a story is accountable to the creator. That's a fact. Lily isn't wrong there. You, we, we can apply Death of the Author. I'm a big proponent of it, but I think that when it comes down to it, Death of the Author doesn't excuse bigoted content in a work. Because even without the creator's influence, you you, you you can still clearly see it if it's there. The thing is, Death of the Author is ultimately, I would argue, intended for thematic analysis. Whereas things like these specific narrative choices, in a sense... I mean, not thematic, like, sort of wider structural analysis, but, like, for example, having, like, a character that is basically a racial stereotype and you've found some way to justify it, that's on you. Yeah, well, that, you know, that's what I think is, like, it's clearly in there. It goes back to that, like, Twitter rule that I agreed with, where it's, like, you know, you can have this, like, this woman who's, like, a sniper who's just completely naked all the time for no reason, and she acts all flirty, but, like, the reason behind it is because her skin... Uh, would would like chafe or burn off if she wore clothes. Yes, <laughs> but the, it was because she breathes through her skin, right? That was the Metal Gear Solid thing. So the the explanation, like you know, even if you take that out, the the outside explanation, it's still kind of like gross and like objectifying. So like I I yeah. think that I think that like when it comes down to it, you don't have to hold the creator directly accountable, but you definitely have to hold the work accountable because bigoted content exists in it. Yes. No. Absolutely. So, yep, we'll all agree with that one. All right. uh, big tick graphic appears on that. Um, <laughs> Ding! Number 11, don't pair adults with minors. That's pedophilia. Again, not wanting to engage in bad faith here. <laughs> Just putting this out. Uh, I feel like it needs to be clarified. Don't pair adults romantically or sexually with, like, that's pedophilia. But, like, if you have something, for example, where it's, like, a more, like father or mother figure or like an avuncular type dynamic that's fine um, again not saying that lily orchard is even saying that i don't i just want to clarify I, I, that. I, yeah i don't know what this is because this seems like shipping advice rather than like writing because how many stories are actually doing this like how many like published stories yeah, no, that's are so actually true. managing to do this like 
This just seems like a, hey, don't do these toxic ships in your consumption of media. This has nothing to do with actual writing. No, you, you're completely right, because I don't think there has been anything, with the exception of things like Lolita, where the main focus is, hey, isn't it fucked up he's doing this? Yeah. The only thing that I can imagine Lily Orchard is gesturing at here is like, hey, Japan, knock it off. But I don't think Lily Orchard's interested in anime, so I don't know, like, what this is for, really. Um, wait, wait for it, wait for it. Rule 12. Don't sexualize teenage characters. That's fair enough. Yeah. But... But... Um, again, this isn't, this isn't a but in terms of an exception to the rule uh, for the writers out there. Yes, don't sexualize teenage characters. But I feel like it needs to be said, and we won't go into this in detail, Lily Orchard herself hasn't always stuck to this rule in certain My Little Pony fanfics. Uh, I also just want to say... This is going to sound really stupid, but I just want everyone to look up uh, Ichigo Kurosaki from Bleach and look at the way that this this man looks, this, like, Nordic supermodel who's apparently a 15-year-old Japanese teenager. It's the same as, like, characters from JoJo who are meant to be 15 but look like Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Well, that, that's the thing, because in JoJo, there's, like, two 17-year-old Japanese students. There's a 40-year-old man from uh, from the Middle East. There's a 30-year-old Frenchman and, like, a 70-year-old guy, and all of them have the exact same body type and level of fitness. It's Lily Orchard's worst nightmare. It's fucked up! Mud, mud slinging aside, yeah, don't sexualize teenage characters. Yeah, don't do it. Fair play. All right, 13. Don't make up weird anime excuses for sexualizing teenage characters. Then in parenthesis, actually 1000, fusion, age of consent in X country is. See rule 10. Okay, okay, but the fusion stuff, I've been over this on my channel before. The fusion stuff is actually a little messed up. In Steven Universe, which is what this fusion comment is directed at, uh, Steven and Connie have a fusion named Stevani, who's considered to be above the age of consent because their age is Steven and Connie's age mixed together, making them, like, 26. Yeah, that, that is kind of fucked up, but again, like, we're not here to talk about Steven Universe, even though Lily will inevitably push us in that direction because... Are we not? Are she we is not? always here to talk about Steven Universe. Like, is that, is that not the real purpose of this list to be like, these are the shows I've disliked in the past five years? This is exactly what I talk about in reviews these days, where people create arbitrary rules in like relation to things they don't like rather than finding the things that truly reach them yep this is the entirety of that video this is this is exactly what i'm talking about this is the problem it's true and by the way this this will come up again later so feel free to cut this in the edit if you feel like it but i rewatched a has been video this morning she mentioned steven universe nine times in it stop why <laughs> in an 11 minute video <laughs> You can't do that. That's not allowed. Like, <laughs> like the show is over. Get over it, for fuck's sake. I had to get over the fact that the show ended. <laughs> Everyone should. I, 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 I should say, uh, just in the interest of full disclosure, I have been drinking throughout this video. <laughs> <laughs> to the people at home. Anyway, just in the interest of on with the show. Just in the interest of full disclosure, that's still my favorite Steven Universe episode. Fair enough. But anyway, ep uh, rule fourteen. Sorry, tip fourteen. Jesus. Making a metaphor for gay slash trans slash ace rep is always inherently inferior to just making a gay slash trans slash ace character. Yes, I would agree with that. However, it's worth considering that certain people operating in studio-driven children's media have restrictions imposed on them. Um, yes, but at the same time, following those restrictions makes you cucked. But again, like, if you don't follow those descriptions, they'll just tell you to rewrite it. Okay, so the real issue is capitalism ruin writing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, I, I would agree with that a hundred thousand fucking percent. <laughs> if you are writing a show for adults or a show outside of studio restraints, yes, don't be a coward, actually write representation. But obviously not everyone working in all systems has that level of freedom, even if they really, really want to. And that needs to be said. Yeah, no, exactly. Because again, this is... Only through the lens of, like, children's cartoons that came out throughout the past decade. Not podcasts, not adult media, not, like, uh, you know, free web series. Like, there is there is so much stuff that just 
is able to be gay. Like, our show is a great example. There are plenty of, of gay and, and trans and non-binary characters on the show. Our main characters are a lesbian ghost and a non-binary ghoul. Like, we we are just able to, to, to do it. Hel- uh, hilarious you saying that, though, Gus, because the next point is... If there are humans in if there are humans in your story, restricting gay slash trans slash ace rep to the non human characters makes you a huge turd. Okay, but we don't do that either. Uh, because... Yeah, no, we, we don't do that because it's a monster mash. <laughs> and even even among the main characters, you know, Evelyn was a human before she was a ghost. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And again, worth saying, I do actually agree with that because again, I don't want to take anything here in bad faith. I think it's very obvious that what Lily is talking about here is the kind of show where it's straight white humans and then there's, like, an alien who is, like, functionally straight and cis, but makes a point of saying, oh, we do not know gender on my planet. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna be fair here, because I was just, like, you know, taking the piss, but I 100% agree with this rule. I think it's kind of a hacky sort of thing to do in your story to just be like ah yes the lizard people who have no gender and and they're always hooking up with each other in their weird lizard holes yeah no exactly exactly because she, she does make a good point there if you're not spreading the rep around it does inherently make those traits seem alien which they're not because they're a hell of a lot more common than most mainstream media most of the lame stream media Ugh. Would give them credit for. Spread that rap! Spread that rap! Spread it like a fine relish. Anyway, so we agree with that one. Rule yeah. 16. If the only gay man in your work is a forpish diva, you're a huge turd. I think that, yeah, there shouldn't be just the one gay character. Yeah, and he shouldn't be a flamboyant stereotype. Yeah, I think it's okay to have one character that is foppish, but you don't have to make them gay. That's important. You don't have to make a foppish dandy character gay. They could be, like, one of those old-fashioned, like, Oh, if only I could marry a beautiful woman. <laughs> yeah, no, to be completely honest with you, this is a slight sidetrack, but, like, <laughs> the most, like, dandyish image-conscious people I've ever met in my life were, like, straight sneaker heads. You're gonna have to explain the term sneaker head, yeah. Is that British? No, it's, it's American. Like, it's, like, people who are, like, obsessed with, like, they've got to have the newest Nikes. They've got to have, like, the name brand merch. Like, oh. I feel like sneaker heads have sort of been absorbed into hype beasts now, but, like... Yeah, okay, I I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, no, those, those people are very, very vain, and typically they're doing it to impress the women folk. 17. If the only lesbian in your work is an abusive rageaholic with vague angst issues and a codependent relationship to a protagonist, you're a huge turd. That doesn't even make sense! Because this is about She-Ra again, right? Oh, uh, what assumes? Okay, well, here's the thing. If this is about She-Ra, then Catra's not the only lesbian in the story because clearly, <laughs> clearly Adora also likes women. <laughs> I think what's really frustrating is that, like, you say that you think that's a vague against uh, Katra in uh, She-Ra, but ironically, it so much better describes Vaggy from Haspin Hotel. Oh my god! What a show! A character she loves. Yeah, a show and a character she loves! Oh my god, what? You're so right. That is literally what... And if you can say that there's some depth to Vaggie's character that makes her not this trope, um, spoiler alert, you can't. Because all we have of the show shows her as this exact trope. Uh, Rule 18? If your only non-binary character is a non-human shapeshifter, you're a huge turd. Again, it's it's about (laughs) She-Ra. I can't help but laugh because Riley is a non-binary shapeshifter, but they're like one of the most nuanced characters in the series because they're one of the main characters. Yeah, and as well, Riley isn't our only non-binary character. There are a whole bunch throughout the show. And again, exactly like we're saying about the lesbian rule, the solution is have multiple characters with these different nuances of identity and make them all different people. Boom. Problem solved. But again, let's be honest, this was a dig against Double Trouble from She-Ra. Yeah, how much of this list is just, I didn't like She-Ra very much, but I'm not doing a video on it? The fact is, just have more than one non-binary character. Make sure, like, some of them are human, if you're doing, like, a mixed thing like we are with Lesser's Morgue. But just, you know, 
don't write stereotypes. D- don't do it. <laughs> number 19. If your only autistic character is an ethically challenged number fetishist, you're a huge turd. Hmm. Okay. Is that another She-Ra? No. I don't no, even, I've not is, seen Shira. Uh, I, I actually don't know what this one is for, but it's another thing that falls under the Vaggy camp because I believe that Lily Orchard thinks that Peridot is the best character in Steven Universe and, like, they are incredibly ethically dubious. They play the nerd thing to a T and uh, they're also, like, commonly headcanoned as being autistic. So I think that this is another one where it's, like, it's too vague to actually apply. It, it's more just, like... Mm. Don't have the only character... Don't have, like, shallow characters, I think is what the past tips have been. It's like, don't have shallow characters, that's it. And and I think it needs to be said that, um... Uh, again, this is just, uh... This is me outwoking Lily Orchard. <laughs> and while, while she has no obligation at all to divulge this information about herself if she doesn't want to, um, if she herself isn't autistic she has no right whatsoever to talk about what makes good and bad autistic representation but i think that you'll find that in a lot of these cases uh lily is speaking from authority on just the entirety of these subjects as if you know why are we why are we here if not that lily orchard is making a bunch of presumptuous claims that we must respond to as writers which by the way onto rule 20 if your only black character is a volatile, hyper angry brute, you're a huge turd. Oh my god, oh my god. these are Again, Don't like... do st- don't don't do stereotypes. Flesh out your characters. Like, who does this anymore? Yeah, like again, like don't get me wrong, I'm sure people do, but like, if you're doing this already, like I'd know to what extent any advice is going to save you. Yeah, like, I I don't know who this is for, because a lot of these statements wouldn't apply to... Because these would not fly in mainstream studios anymore, because... We'll get called out for this. Well, not only we'll get called out for this, we'll lose money, which is always the motive with these big companies. If we don't cast black actors, if we don't make black movies, we're gonna lose money. And the same applies to, like, a lot of other demographics, because, um... Well, okay, I don't want to get too deep into the rabbit hole of box office and all that, but I think that we deserve more uh, Asian-led fantasy movies that aren't fucking Mulan. <laughs> yep, very true. Also, worth saying, again, if you're not black, you don't get to say that. Alright, so so what what ethnicity or, uh, or type of person is the next rule about? <laughs> <laughs> well, y- you guessed the type of rule it was. Trust me, these types will end soon. Oh my god. <laughs> 22. If the only trans woman in your cast is a drag queen in all but name, you're a huge turd. As someone who isn't a trans woman, I will say, fair enough, yeah. Don't fucking do that. I have nothing to say on this. Yeah, I think, again, I I, I agree in principle with, like, the last, like, several tips that are basically all just the same tip of don't do bad representation through stereotypes. <laughs> like, that's... Yeah, and and again... That's everything. That's, that's um, the last, like... Yeah. Just how many are there? Because <laughs> I feel like these could be boiled down to just, like... 50 tips. No, no. The, the, these last few could have just been, you know, don't do racial, ethnic, gender, or, like, neurodivergent stereotypes. Yeah, literally. Just... Because, again, we're practicing what uh, we preach. Neither of us are trans women, so we're staying in our lane. It's true. And moving on. Yep. If you force a woman to kiss her abuser, you're a huge turd. she Does that happen? she <laughs> Again, it's she Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what else this could be because, like, I, like I don't remember the scene in Legend of Korra where um Korra just went up to Zaheer and Zaheer was like, "Shall we share a mouth kiss after I crippled you with poison?" And then they did. I, I don't remember that. Did that happen? Did Steven kiss the diamonds? Mm-hmm. Did Steven kiss Blue Diamond? <laughs> Did he kiss Blue Diamond before I could? I mean, Steven kissing the diamonds would contradict other rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I just, how much has this happened? I need receipts. I need examples. Critique specific things and why they were bad. This doesn't work in a vacuum. Yeah, th- these aren't writing rules because the fact is it wouldn't, ac- like, who's, who's sitting here thinking, ah, oh, can't wait for my great abuser kissing scene. Really looking forward to writing that one. <laughs> and the thing is, 
I think you can have a character kiss an abuser before they realize they're an abuser, or as part of, like, a, a, a story where they get out of the abuse. There's a lot of different ways that this could happen without you being a bad person. There's more nuance here than Just I can give Just goes to show these to. hard and fast rules don't make oh sense. Oh my god. These aren't writing tips. These are wronging tips. Okay, next one. So I was eating a piece of sandwich. Anyway, 24. <laughs> if you sideline every... <laughs> I keep fucking laughing just at the absurdity of this. Oh my god. <laughs> Easy, man. Don't choke on your snackies. <laughs> One of them. Oh god, oh god don't god. die. I, I, I have the social distance. I can't save you. <laughs> 24. If you sideline every non-white character in your cast to focus on a white boy with anger issues and a tendency toward hostility getting a redemption arc... You're a huge turd. Uh, I mean, this does happen. Oh, I'll yeah. admit, this does actually happen a fair bit. So I agree. Don't do see, that. <laughs> see, I agree with this. I think that this should be this rule should be like recalled and instead called the Jean principle. And what the Jean principle is mm. is if you have a cast of interesting characters that your show's premise is it's ostensibly be about them. Don't add a milk toast white boy protagonist whose story arc is about how they need to prove themselves that they can fulfill the Joseph Campbell hero myth. This could be the John principle, or it could be called the Stephen principle. No, exactly, exactly, because it's that annoying thing of like, this is a character for you to relate to in this like field of really cool characters who you'd probably like to watch more. Or it's the like sleazier like harem. Oh yeah. The like perks the like perks of being a wallflower type. Wouldn't it be great if a load of interesting people came into your life and redeemed you? Oh my you? god, I'm so glad you brought up Perks of Being a Wallflower. That movie is like one of my least favorite movies of all time. Yeah, no, it's just, it's just one of those things where it's like, what if a bunch of people came in and like did your emotional labor? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, exactly. It's like don't have milk toast standard white boy protagonists. I think we can all agree that they're kind of played out and done. But I think that this rule loses a lot of its um applicability by having the particular trope be so specific. Like they're not all anger issue boys. I've noticed that's I've noticed that's a running trend <laughs> yeah. in a lot of these rules that there's there's a weird kind of specificity to them. Anyway, are you ready for the next one? 25. Quarter of the way there. Justifying horny armor designs or horny clothing designs with sexual agency makes you a huge turd. Characters don't have sexual agency. You made them that way as a justification. See rule 10. By and large, I mostly agree with this. I think you have to have a lot of context and a lot of like actual discussion of sexuality in your work to make your weird anime boob plate make any sense and even then boob plate that's a bad example i i think what's an issue here for me is the this is kind of a trojan horse rule because i i agree that like unnecessarily sex oh okay one thing for a start if everyone in your thing regardless of gender has sexy armor fair enough but like generally if it's like like the men have like practical armor and the women have sexy armor yeah, that, that's... You've done a bad there, bro. Yeah. But what I will disagree with is completely devoid from this armor thing, it can actually be incredibly important for characters to have sexual agency. That can be vital to narratives. Oh, yeah, no, 100%. Like, d like let's not get bogged like, down in that, the armor. That's, that's an incredibly bad point that's been Trojan-horsed into a decent point. No, you're, you're so right, because I got confused by the whole costume thing. Like, like, like the, like disgusting weeb that I am, I was completely distracted by the idea of anime characters in skimpy clothing, <laughs> and I completely missed the actual bad point that was being made here. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, listen to this. Characters don't have sexual agency, but, like, uh, like, listen to this. Characters don't have sexual agency. You made them that way, but, like, by that same logic, you could say characters have no agency. Characters don't breathe either, but they, you know, somehow manage to continue walking and going about their day. I, I was reading this to Lexi uh, earlier, and uh, who is the voice of Riley in Lesser's Morgue uh, for the people at home. And <laughs> she had the very funny response of, um, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to ask my characters their consent in bringing them into existence. Oh my god. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's classic. Also, you've clearly made the rounds on this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, we're with you on horny armor designs, not with you on sexual agency. A character's sexual agency, if it's relevant, can be extremely important to the story. Yeah, you, you can have discussions of sexuality in a work, and sometimes those will inform the costumes, sometimes they won't. It may be better to figure out the extent to which you're doing it before you decide what they're wearing. Exactly, and that's a great tip. Yes. Anyway, next to that, 26. Related to the above, if your justification is to just be honest and say you are og- say you like ogling sexy characters, you're still a huge turd, but slightly less of a turd than above. Slightly. Well, that's just sex shaming. That is really obnoxious because, um, have you heard of the game Nier Automata? Uh, yes. Okay, so the main, like, robot girl in that has, like, this really short skirt and, like, these heels, and that's, like, part of her design. And when the guy who made the game was asked about it, they said, why did you go with the short skirt and the heels? And he says, well, okay, the main reason is that I like girls. And I was like, props, that... Mm. owning up to it that's just honest like he wanted to make a game with a a character with heels and a skirt and because they're a robot cyborg character they can still move in them because they've got superpowers again we're going to introduce some nuance into this if you are for example only doing this to the female characters or certain female characters then yeah you are objectifying but if you're equal opportunity with this then at that point, if you are still criticizing people for it, then it's just sex shaming. I, I think there's definitely a deeper discussion to be had, and I think I'd err more on the side that, like, if people are honest with the reasons why they're putting horny stuff in their series, then I give them way more credit than all of the people who are super coy about, like, oh, Cortana looks like a naked woman in Halo because she wants to put people off guard. Yeah, no, that's goofy. Also, she's an AI. Is anyone going to be like, wow, I really want to fuck that hologram? <laughs> like, no, the thing is, I don't I don't want to go too deep into this because don't want to make arguments in bad faith, don't want to put words in Lily's mouth, but elements of this will come back later and we'll get to discuss it deeper then. Oh, okay, fair enough, fair enough. 27. Don't worry about... This is, I genuinely think... One of the worst rules in the entire thing. Oh, baby. Oh, bring it on. So be ready for that. It's not offensive. This is just genuinely, as a professional writer, I know writers will differ, but, like, from my personal experience, I would call this 100% dead wrong. I'm ready. Don't worry about not having everything planned out beforehand. No writer or creator plans everything beforehand, and the ones who say they do are filthy liars. Writers have at best one to two story beats they're determined to include. Everything else is by the seat of their pants. This is not... That's just pantly untrue. This is not universal! Different people have different approaches! Oh my god! (laughs) If that works for you, fine. You know, live your truth. Do whatever works for you, but like... Gus and I, for example, we've never done it like that. So, important context, Gus and I share a lot of writing history. We started writing together on a show called Congeria. Uh, we've written, like, other content together. We, we wrote Less is More, obviously. But a vital thing is we've written a full screenplay together as it's well. It's true. It's a good one. And a key part of that process was rigorously, scene by scene, planning it out. This is This criticism, this rule, only applies to two things i can i can only see this applying to two things and it's multi-season shows where they get uh like more seasons than they knew what to do with or shonen manga where they have to write a new chapter every single week like those are the only two situations in which it's kind of inevitable that uh you're going to have to fly by the seat of your pants however i think that And I hate calling people hypocrites because I don't think it makes them wrong necessarily, but this completely contradicts the, like, the rule earlier about LGBT representation in studio-driven projects. Like, in this, you're supposed to just kind of, like, lean into what the studio is making you do, and then in that, you're supposed to completely, like, uh, break all the rules and move past it. I, I don't think that not having planning allows for more freedom. I think that if... 
anyone like me has read a bunch of shonen manga, you know that the serialization has killed a lot of these stories and forced them to not reach their true potential. And it's the same thing with, like, see shows that run, like, for over, like, five seasons. It's like... The Simpsons, Spongebob, uh, all these fairly odd parents. Supernatural, maybe, but who knows? It's hell! It's hell! Jigoku um, <laughs> da! Anyway... Uh, this next one, I think, is going to make you angry again. <laughs> 28. Don't try and, then in quotes, do what Avatar did, end quotes. You can't. Even the people who made Avatar can't make another show do what Avatar did. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. It's just being angry about Korra. Oh my god. That's not just be angry about Korra, because obviously Lily Orchard made a, like... This is just advice for the creators of Ruby. <laughs> I mean, in, in retrospect, this is good advice, but at the same time, I'm just like, I'm holding both my middle fingers to the sky and whirling them around, because anybody who was going to set out to make the next Avatar was already doomed from the start. If, if anybody who's out there, anybody who's out there who's like, I'm going to make the next Star Wars or the next Lord of the Rings or the next Avatar. These, these two whirling birds are for you. Okay, I think unironically I agree with this rule and that's kind of scary so we can move on. Genuine piece of advice. Don't ever try to be the next someone else. Try to be the first you. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's that's a way that a sane person would say it, but I, I'm still whirly-birding. We should have a counter at the end of this video to see how many of these tips were actual tips, and how many were, like, just screeds. <laughs> yeah. No, this one's gonna piss you off as well. I can't fucking believe this. 29. Low-stakes interpersonal conflict will always be more satisfying in the long run than high-stakes saving the world. And then tagged onto this... Friends is more popular than your favorite anime for a reason. Oh, oh I'm dual wielding again. Oh! <laughs> it, it helps that Friends is in English for a start. But also, also, just... Go off, King. I, I just can't believe that it's like, man, Friends is more popular than Cowboy Bebop. So that means that Cowboy Bebop by the rules of capitalism, is an objectively worse piece of art. Yeah, as I'm sure uh, Lily Orchard would agree to herself, popularity equals quality. I This doesn't make any sense. And also, always. It's always better? Low stakes is always yeah. better than high stakes? Now listen, I, I like some low stakes stuff. I also like parodies of high stakes stuff, like Wander Over Yonder and One Punch Man. A, a big part of the appeal for me is because they have, like, the highest possible stakes, but they use anticlimax in such a brilliant way. And we do the same thing. Yeah. We do the same thing in Less is Morgue. I, I, think what, I think what bothers me here is the always, because I think there's something to be said about making the stakes in the story only as high as they need to be to for them to stay personal. Because I, I think that, like, when people say high stakes, they think high statistical stakes. They don't think... Well, this really means a lot to the character. They think... High emotional stakes. Yeah. Like, for example, um, uh, Infinity War, that's technically high stakes, but a lot of that stuff is kind of rendered impersonal. Whatever your stakes are, just make us care about them. Yeah, make us care. That's the most important thing. Whether you are talking about the destruction of a galaxy or the destruction of a friendship, yeah. just make us care. Yeah, whether your stakes are raw, medium rare, or well done, you need to just make sure that they're what the customer ordered. Delicious. Anyway, mm -mm. 30. Th this is another one that's... Ugh, okay. Tip 30. Choose whether you're a comedy or a drama at the start and stick to it. Don't make a comedy and turn it into a drama later on. That just annoys people. Oh, fuck that. Fuck you, oh, Raphael Bob Watsburg, I guess. That. Oh my god. So this is just don't do cerebussyndrome.tvtropes.com. <laughs> this yeah. is just what that is. Um, this, I feel like this one's directed at both Steven Universe and Star vs. the Forces of Evil. It's, it's really telling that you can just go over these rules as if you're, it's like, well, which show is this about? Yeah, this is like the forensic reading. Yeah. Jesus. <sighs> Oh my god. All right, so transferring this into an actual workable tip, be fluid. Have a weird, like, tonal and genre fusion. Do what works. Some of my favorite things ever, right, have been horror comedies where things have started off really silly, but by the time it's getting towards the end, I'm like, holy shit, 
Like, I haven't even noticed how it's happened, but, like, I'm digging my fucking fingers into the sea. Mm. Yeah, I think like, I think this is important. Uh, this, is, this is, like, a, one of my writer's tips, is that genre is primarily a marketing tool in the current day and age. Yes. You should know which demographics you should market to, but you can bounce between genre because it itself is not a iron cage for your story. Exactly. Genre is what people will will try to apply to your work after you've written it. All you need to consider, exactly as Gus very wisely said, is target audience. Yeah. If you know what you're making something for, the rest will come. Next, next one. 31. This is another one I agree with, to be honest, but with caveats. World building is like salt. A pinch can make it better, ten cups of it will not. The way I see it is, world building is not like an inherently good or bad thing regardless of the quantity it's all about the uh elegance of the application of world building yeah totally and i think that like everything world building should not subsume the story being told like the the filling out of wikis and stuff should not come before anything but again this feels more like no, you know what? Maybe authors create the fandoms that, that perpetuate this stuff. So it, it could be an author problem, honestly. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you that Yeah, well there's there's a kernel of wisdom hidden here about the amount of world building you should do. I would split this into two rules. The first rule is don't ever make exposition and info dumping your crutch because it's not compelling storytelling. And the second rule I'd split it into is don't let planning out your world be a form of making procrastination feel productive in terms of like what i prefer because i feel like this is not universal i like it when stories only have as many rules and like stipulations as would be interesting for the characters to either break or follow like um a good example of this is madoka magica where the greater scope of the world is never explored but you learn everything you need to do about where the powers come from, what the consequences are, and uh, by the time that story ends, you know basically what the characters have done to address their personal situations, and the implications of such beyond that are uh, obvious without needing like tons and tons of explanation past that point. No, absolutely, and that's a great example, again, of how these rules can often be flexible. Exactly. Next one, and again, this is something that I, like, 95% agree with again. Mm. Rule 32, characters should always come before anything else. I, I, like, characters are personally my favourite part of storytelling, so I'm inclined to personally agree with this. But at the same time, take, for example, the work of Junji Ito. Yeah, characters don't come first there. They exist in it, but it's primarily the the set pieces and the build up to the actual exactly things occurring in there. Exactly, the characters in things like the work of Junji Ito. And again, this is a matter of taste and personal preference. I completely get that, but like the characters in that are meant to act as uh, a kind of like insert your perspective here. Just so you could imagine, oh, imagine if this awful, scary, weird thing happened to you. The characters are there to let you see what's occurring. And this honestly happens a lot in horror. The fact is, again, I wouldn't say this says, oh, this rule is therefore wrong. It's just that maybe we don't need it as a rule. I think that this rule immediately following the previous, like, world building rule just implies preference to me. It just implies, like don't like put your setting before your characters and i think to that you can have stories that are more about like the city as a character than the characters like like sin city for example it has characters in it and they tell a story but it's more about how they like uh lock together and create an overarching uh the anime durarara and um the similar one uh Bacchino. Bacchino. yeah 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 so the same can be said for like atmospheric mood pieces or things like very intricate mysteries. Like, for example, 
the plot is definitely the main character of Knives Out. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think that if you focused on the characters first and foremost, you'd be missing out on what they do. Because that's the other thing. Characters are what they do in the plot. Yeah, no, absolutely. But again, I feel like what's really important to say for context is that obviously, while uh, she makes the mistake of not declaring this and instead just acts like they're writing tips, this is implicitly for multi-season studio children's cartoons. Uh, yep. Yep. I can't believe I forgot. <laughs> Rather than, for example, self-contained pieces of art like movies, where it can be about, like, an intricately uh, positioned plot, which characters are just vehicles to, like, turn the cogs for. But again, like, though she, uh, she doesn't declare her biases, resulting in us needing to do it, this is just all about children's cartoons, because at the risk of sounding like a dick, it's all she fucking consumes. That and the odd Star Wars. Oh, the odd Star Wars. All right, all right. Ne next, next one. Next one. Next one. Again, this is actually another one that I agree with. So I believe it's a correct rule, but there's an amusing hypocrisy here. Mm. I want you to hold the grinning face of Alistair the Radio Demon in your mind as I'm reading this to you. Why? Why would you? Rule thirty-three. The protagonist should be a protagonist, not just a vessel for the antagonist to hog the story. If you're going to make a villain protagonist, <laughs> just open with that. Oh my god! She described Alistair the Radio Demon as one of her... F oh, again, I watched this th I watched this, this morning. I'm not putting words in my mouth. <laughs> oh my god. One of her favourite characters in all of animation. You can play the clip right now if you want to, or you can go watch the video... <laughs> She said that. <laughs> now, you're, now, you're, now you're just getting mean. <laughs> but it's so easy. This is easy. me like rope, wrapping like a bike chain around a baseball bat. <laughs> this is, you've just rolled up like Stelio Cantos. <laughs> Stelio, Stelio Cantos. All right. But it's, am I wrong? I, am I wrong? No, I think it's no, just worth saying. You're not wrong. But also like, again, the, the, the problem with a lot of these tips is how heavily jargonized they are by, like, TV tropes lingo. Because, like, yeah. the idea of villain protagonist versus, like, regular protagonist, uh, these distinctions are not hard lines. It's it's uh people, frankly, like Lily Orchard, who try to convince you that these are hard lines. It's... It's... Reuters would call that an anti-hero. Yeah, oh my god, like... That's the actual literary term for that, not villain protagonist. Yeah, okay, so there's a show that I really like um, that's on Netflix now, you can go watch it. It's an anime, but it's an adaptation of a manga that came out in the 80s. It's called Doro Hidoro, and nobody in that show is unequivocally the hero. It is just people on different sides of an action-based conflict. Morality goes out the window. If I were to describe it in D&D terms, everybody's chaotic neutral. They're all following their own path. And a show like that could only exist beyond the frameworks of protagonist, antagonist, villain, hero, redemption arc. Like, all of this jargon that Lily Orchard believes is uh, the rigid structure of storytelling only because they've they've been trapped in this fandom bubble where that's all amateurs talk about. Amateurs who have done nothing. Yeah, I, I think you could say the exact same thing about a subgenre of movies very near and dear to my heart. Though again, she's not talking about movies. Don't know which one she's even seen outside of Marvel and Star Wars like all fucking YouTubers. Sorry. Oh my god, it's um, true. <laughs> The British Gangster movie, where it's just an ensemble cast of colourful weirdos. Everyone watching this, if you haven't watched Snatch, go fucking watch Snatch. And then watch Layer Cake, and then watch Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels, and you'll have a great fucking time, I guarantee. Yeah, now can you tell me, Henry, if if the <laughs> uh, main characters in heavy dual-wielded quotes of Snatch are protagonists or villain protagonists? Again, they're all gangsters. <laughs> yeah, they they all just have their own goals and, and, like, things to do throughout the story that bounce off of each other in an entertaining way. Like, that's how those movies work. Yeah, the closest you have to a character, to a protagonist in that is uh, Jason Statham's character, but that's just because he's uh, the narrator. The fact is, when you watch that movie, he has no agency over that plot. He is an entirely reactive character. In some ways, you could probably say that Mickey, Brad Pitt's character, is the protagonist because his actions move the story along. 
It's it's funny that you mentioned that, and I won't dwell on this. I brought up a little bit of Shonen discourse earlier. Apparently, Bleach by Taikubo is heavily inspired by the way Snatch and other uh, British gangster movies work. Hmm. Um, and very recently, uh, a, a YouTuber who I very much respect and enjoy his content, Super Eye Patch Wolf, uh, said that Ichigo, the protagonist, was very reactive which it's neither here nor there mm. like i think there's a discussion to be had about that but it's interesting that uh that would come up and then you describe the main character of snatch as reactive it really makes you think about the influences to um popular media like whether they be children's cartoons or shonen manga like perhaps there are these multiple ways of telling stories that we've kind of been locked into thinking that the rules are ironclad when really it's a grand mixture, a grand experiment of different ways of doing things. No, ab absolutely, absolutely. In my opinion, some of the best things you can do as a writer is read, watch, and listen widely. Go out of your comfort zone. Because as Brian Koppelman, uh, an excellent screenwriter and like screenwriting teacher, said, um, when you go back, you'll have more colors to paint with. Yeah, uh, in, in the words of Gargak from the cinematic masterpiece Horseshoe Finale, true zen is found in eclecticism. Exactly. You ready for the next one? This is a, another thing that's just, like, a, a preference. Rule 34, lol. Um, <laughs> perspective... Sh <laughs> all right, all right, wait, wait. I just had to get it out of my system. <laughs> Go ahead. You just weren't ready for the lol, were you? No, no, I was not. <laughs> I would have thought anyway. nothing of it if you didn't lol. <laughs> perspective shifts are a staple of storytelling. Having only one perspective isn't a stylistic choice. It's just crap. <laughs> what does that even Whoa, mean, Lily? That, oh my god, that sucks because it doesn't even matter what we're talking about. Saying X isn't a stylistic choice. It's just, it just sucks. Like, that, I that to me, I think... We could just move on to the next rule after this because you apply that to anything and that's the exact kind of like nonsense that I've spent my entire career on YouTube railing against. The idea that someone's like, if you do something differently, it's not a choice that you're making as a writer or an artist. It's just against my personal rules. So therefore, it's objectively bad. Yeah, no, absolutely. And as well, like, what the fuck does that mean too? It, it, it means nothing. Yeah, there are only two contexts in which I can think of a perspective shift. E either, like, the narrator or, like, viewpoint character of a book changes, or when you suddenly start playing a different character in a video game. Because by the nature of the visual medium, you don't... It hops around. Yeah, like, but you don't need it. You, like, you can have... I think any story should include multiple perspectives from multiple characters, like from a philosophical standpoint. But oh yeah, no, absolutely. You don't need to have multiple point of view characters. That's just arbitrary. No, because the thing is, again, you can if it works for your story, but you don't have to. Again, from a horror perspective, because I'm a prolific horror writer and I've been paid for that, so I, c I can say that. Yeah. Um, the fact is, sometimes in horror, this sense of like being trapped in a single embattled perspective, thinking what is going on, not knowing, feeling small, feeling disempowered, is incredibly scary and exciting. Like, for example, imagine if Hereditary, halfway through, switched to the perspective of like the cult members putting their plans into place. <laughs> then it would turn into a British uh, gangster movie. No, it would turn into a heist movie. <laughs> it's a heist movie where what we're trying to break into is a teenage boy's soul. Oh my god. <laughs> so here's the plan. To be fair, people at home, that's a great writing prompt if you want to write, like, cult, like, a cult heist movie where the thing they're trying to get into is allowing their dark god to possess, like, a... Uh, high-profile, like, victim. Oh, boy. It's almost like the more we go over these rules, the more we realize that breaking the mold and, and trying to create exceptions and doing your own vision will, you know, inevitably result in something more fascinating than just preventing people from being creative. Absolutely. Now, 35. If you're making a cartoon, hire writers. Don't have your storyboarders write the story. That's not what they're there for. Artists draw, writers write. Artists cannot take over for writers on a whim. Again, just Steven Universe. <laughs> That's isn't just it? Steven Universe. But uh, counterpoint, um, Mad Max Fury Road exists mostly in its current form because the storyboarders were dead on point. Other counterpoint, artists can also be writers. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. This is just... They're, they're not two different breeds of people. This is just Steven Universe bitterness again. Yep, yep. Oh my god. 
All right, next. Th- th- 36, related to rule two. Will they, won't they isn't a fun story. It's just addiction peddling. We need to stop pretending Ross slash Rachel was good storytelling and learn to appreciate Chandra, Monica, Joey, and Rachel. But Friends is more popular. But Friends is more popular than your favorite anime. It must be yeah. good. 37. Romance trope, but gay, is not an absolute rule to live by. If she taught us anything, it's that gay Raylo was not actually an improvement. Again, it's just, I don't like this show. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's a thing saying, hey, this thing that's a rule doesn't have to be a rule. Making this not a rule. <gasps> I- <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> These are getting redundant. <laughs> 38. Someone on this hell site once made the remark, we need more lesbian non-con because purity is boring. This is a dangerous, violent person. Do not listen to them. They do not have a point. Seriously, my fucking God, what is wrong with people? Oh, that, that is, that is just another, like, I have taken one person's tweet to be indicative of all the takes. Like, I, I cannot remember right the last time I saw lesbian rape in anything. Like, for a start, you shouldn't, you just shouldn't rate rape as titillating in general, but at the same time, lesbians can be rapists too. But also, to have on your list of general rules, like, I once saw one person say this, I don't know if they had any credentials, I don't know if they've written anything, but they are a dangerous person. This would be, like, in the middle of Pixar's, like, 12 rules of storytelling. They were just... A man on a bus once said to me, anyway, 39... (laughs) Women who fetishize abuse, then in brackets, Raylos, Catradoras, Kigos, don't know who that is, etc. And present it as something feminist and paint detractors as misogynists are gaslighting you. Don't listen to them. Again, not writing advice. More petty fandom bullshit. Oh my god, I, I literally just think that as this uh, Twitter rant went on, Lily Orchard's brain began to break down. Because now, this is just getting sad. At this point. Rule 40. If abuse fetishists are giving you shit for not caving to their demands, just block them. Don't argue with them. Don't debate them. Don't treat them with good faith. Just block them and get on with your day. (laughs) Not writing advice. That's just Twitter advice! Oh my god! How can... Twitter is not a good place to talk about your stories. Here's how to survive Twitter. No doubt. There will be a bring it on. Lily's guide to, to Twitter and writing. Rule 41. Rape victims are not villains and should never be written as villains. Don't be like at Blizzard Entertainment. It costs zero dollars not to be a misogynistic pig. Number one, it's rape survivors. Number two, P- uh, as I said earlier... People who have been abused can also be abusers. Yeah, this is this is really frustrating and, and bad. Because, like, you don't want to argue against it because you sound like a dick. But at the same time, in fiction, where the people aren't real, you're allowed to have more nuance. Like, anybody could be a villain. Anybody could be a hero. It's all about the story you're telling. Like, to, to, yeah. to assume that every story is going to have the same code of ethics as, like, the reader or the writer is, like, that is what leads to this whole, like, villain protagonist protagonist thing. It's all about, like, whether or not this character fits into my frame of reference for ethics. I think that that is a hugely limiting thing, and there are so many YouTubers on this platform that are still stuck in the mindset of, a character must do everything that I would agree with in that situation, or they're not a hero. Yeah, it's stupid. The reality is, and I said this to uh, Meg this morning, I want to write things for smart people, not the dumbest, most impressionable people ever. Yeah. Yeah, lowest common denominator. Pfft, I can't divide. I'm going to write for... <laughs> Never mind. 42. If straight men really hate a certain character, but lesbians love them, there's a 90% chance that is your best character. Not writing advice. Shut up! <laughs> I'm sorry. Not I'm sorry. writing I'm sorry. advice. <laughs> I'm sorry. But the idea that, like, if, um, if, if I dislike a character that makes the character better (laughs) like because i'm you know yeah yeah, like i i just don't understand like first of all i think the framing of all straight men is a little sus just in this uh framework not to say that there isn't like yes like does does that include straight trans men yeah does that include straight black men does that include straight neurodivergent men she's she's, like uh she's talking about a loosely defined category of like the quote-unquote neck beard which in itself is a term that is derogatory to people who have difficulty grooming so like 
I just, I don't get this fascination with just being like, ah, yes, all straight men. Because I know a lot of other straight guys, and they don't all agree with me. We don't all agree on the same things. And, I like, I hesitate to believe that if we did rally around disliking a character, that doesn't mean that the character's good. Furthermore, who are these lesbians in question that just love everything we hate? I don't think these people exist in great quantities. Not writing advice. Stop treating people like monoliths. Moving on. 43. If one of your writers believes Simon, then in brackets, Infinity Train, was misunderstood and Grace is a villain, that writer should be fired immediately. <laughs> You've seen Infinity Train? I have seen, I have seen Infinity Train season three, and I know what she's talking about. And, okay, side note, I watched that season of Infinity Train, and I thought it was really hacky. This should just be a video about Infinity Train. I would have loved to see someone discuss this, because, like... Are there people out there who really looked at Simon and saw, like, his progression and were like, yeah, that's a guy I feel bad for? Before we move on, <laughs> what's really funny is, because we've contextualized uh, so much of this around the fact that we're writers and we've created this show, uh, Less is Morgue, is that so much of this is very Riley-esque. In like it's like weird tangents and like that's the thing. That's the thing. This just comes out of nowhere, and suddenly we're talking about Infinity Train season three, and I'm like, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I kind of agree with what's going on here. But why is this on the list? Forty four. The best solution to a love triangle is polyamory. Depends on the love triangle. Yeah, seriously. What if one's? What if one of them's a shithead? By the way, if you can hear hammering, <laughs> that's not me like pounding my my desk with my fist. That's just actual hammering happening in the background chun chun but yeah anyway like again nuance to it it, it depends on the fucking love triangle oh my god i'm not a fan of love triangles personally but because i'm not lily orchard i'm not pretending my preferences are hard and fast right there's rules. not a stone people sorry right there's not tips. a stone don't be protective of your list of uh, uh, your things that are chiseled into your stone because there's no stone 45 if you have a male character who actually shows respect and admiration of a woman, and some of your viewers call that character a simp, there is a 90% chance you have a good character. Not writing advice. What the fu Again, this is just how the audience reacts. So much of this assumes that the people reading this tweet thread have an actual show, as if anyone who has ever worked in television gives a shit what Lily Orchard has to say. <laughs> uh, I am gonna t just say a hot take here. Ang is a simp. Let's move on. Ang is a white... <laughs> Soccer is a wife guy. Anyway. <laughs> 46. Mary Sue is not a real criticism. It's thinly veiled misogyny. Always disregard it. I'm not touching mm, that. Yep, yep. It's sometimes Let's... true that often, oftentimes people who throw around Mary Sue accusations are misogynists but like yeah well, not okay, here's it. the one thing because i've touched upon this in a previous video it's my video uh overpowered characters break storytelling which i'll link up up in the top and i basically compare it to power fantasy like the term is used in the same way if it's a male who can just do everything and is super strong it's a power fantasy if it's a woman who can do it it's a mary sue and I think they're comparable and I think that the terms are both buzzwords that people throw out without the nuanced like breaking down into the stories. Kind of like how a lot of things on this list don't go into specific examples and just throw out universal statements that don't get elaborated upon. Yeah, pretty much. Rule 47. Emotional vulnerability does not make a female character anti-feminist. I'm not sure anyone since 1995 has believed now, that. Now listen, I like uh, women in my stories, but if they express emotions, oh boy, I cannot. <laughs> but, but again, like, <laughs> it, it's arguing about this, like, against this, like, weird Disney feminist, like, strong female <laughs> character, I just, straw man. I'm just imagining there's, like, a, like a... Like, Lily Orch is just imagining, like, a guy with, like, his feet up on his desk smoking a cigar with a fedora, like, yeah, that's nice, sweetheart. I guess we'll put a, a female character in this story. Yeah, put her in the picture. Yeah, put her in the picture. But anyway. Yeah, the women folk are coming out in big numbers for this one. Yeah, again, just, like, it, it just, I don't think this is a point that has any relevance in the modern day. The, uh, I will not mention his name, but this, to me, feels like a tip that Lily Orchard may have picked up from one of her YouTube mentors who, uh, for many reasons, oh people don't really like. 48. Goblins are inherently anti-Semitic. 
let's f- move the fuck on. Yeah, all, all I'll say on this is, Lily, if you're Jewish, we're having a conversation. If you're not, shut the fuck up. Let's move on. God damn it. Oh, fucking God damn it. Because, again, if you're not Jewish, you don't get to say what is and isn't anti-Semitic. I, I just, I, I, this is not a, I hate that this is like on this list of writing tips. You just ran out. Yeah. Anyway, 49. If your first thought when told about a bigoted trope, then in parenthesis, bury your gays, goblins, etc., is to try and figure out how to do it well, you are a huge turd who is missing the point. It's not that these tropes aren't done well, it's that they're done too much. I think you missed the point in your own thing. Never, ever try to do something that no one's ever done before. Never, ever try to break from the conventions. Traditions exist for a reason. Even though all the things you praise about storytelling are people being brave and breaking from tradition and allowing minorities to be in works. Ah! I'm getting real close to the mic to say subversive. Ah! um... (laughs) Sorry, sorry. (laughs) <laughs> just Lord Hater jerked out of a nightmare whenever he hears that word. But yeah, that's the thing. Like, what she, what she doesn't seem to get is that, like, improving upon a bad trope makes it not the bad trope anymore. You've changed the essence. Like, for example, for example, a joke that we've often done with Less is More that directly relates to this is, we have joked that by killing Evelyn and making her a ghost before the series starts, we've made her an unburyable gay. Because you can't kill what's already dead. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's there's just so much nuance to this. And for this rule to follow immediately after the goblin one, it's like it's like she's tempting yeah. fate. She's like, I, I see what you said about the goblin. Did you disagree with that? Well, here's the rule that says you're a piece of shit for thinking that. This this next one is hilarious, given so much of what's is, been discussed at this point. Is this the last point. one? Are there 50 rules? No, there's 100. <laughs> what? We'll go, <laughs> we'll go fast. <laughs> 50. Writing a relationship based on a dynamic or trying to get a particular trope, i.e. enemies to lovers, into the story is a bad decision. D- wh- okay, now I get why there's a hundred, because this is just the same rule again. And also just the idea of, like, don't you dare have intentions. This is getting into Jordan Peterson territory. This is so weird. Yeah, because he's all like, hey, never plan. Let the art flow through you. <laughs> don't have intentions. Yeah. That is political propaganda. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to just, like, huff glue and then, like, let it flow out of you like an ancient Greek oracle. You're going to give him a relapse if, if you mention huffing glue. Don't. Oh, Jesus. Jordan, <laughs> Jordan, if you're watching this, please lay down. You've done enough. But again, like, writing a relationship based on a dynamic, like, do, do, you, do you know what a dynamic is? Oh my god. Really? A dynamic is, a dynamic is literally a descriptor for the nature of a relationship. Like, of fucking course you're going to plan that with a character. You, you you don't just put the two characters in a room, then come back and see if they've copulated. You yourself said earlier they don't have agency. Yeah, like, the thing is, you you need to write some kind of dynamic. Otherwise, you end up with Ruby, where there's four main characters and none of them have clear dynamics with each other. 51. Vitriol does not immediately render criticism invalid. If you tone police criticism, you will likely miss something important. Well, I hope in that case, if you ever watch this, Lily, you've listened really closely and won't take any issue with our frustration at parts. That is not writing advice. That's just YouTube video advice. Oh my god! Next. That's not even YouTube video advice. That's reacting to a YouTube video advice. Yeah. 52. Your fandom will fight and argue. This is how people solve conflicts. It's typically better to let people fight it out than to be complacent and beg people to just stop fighting. Again, Lily. Not writing. Not writing Not advice. writing. Oh my god, not writing. I, let's rapid throw through these. Let's read them, and the first one that's about yeah. writing we'll, we'll respond to in longer depth. 53. Related to the above, every headcanon is valid. Should never leave your mouth. Do you want pedophiles and fascists in your fanbase? Because that's how you get pedophiles and fascists in your fanbase. Not, not a writing, writing rule. Next. 54. Speaking out against abuse fetishists... By the way, abuse fetishists just seem to be people who, like, want a story to be anything but a fucking coffee shop AU. <laughs> by, oh my god! By, <laughs> you got... By, oh my god, you got her! That, like... like whoa! We said earlier, 
um, Addison and Meg were talking about this. <laughs> and, and they said that you could tell the reason she loves Hesburn Hotel is that there's no fucking conflict in it. <laughs> that's, that's so true. Because, like... Because if Charlie had shaken Alistair's hand, everything that she likes about the show would fall apart. <laughs> because because their dynamic would suddenly be toxic. It's so true. Oh my god. Yet yeah, no, there's no consequences. Holy shit. Speaking out against abuse fetishists, pedophiles, and bigots in your fan base will always be better in the long run than being quiet and complacent. It might be exhausting to deal with, but it's better for everyone in the long run. I loved how like that two rules ago we were saying like just let people fight it out. And now it's saying, make sure you step in. Also, not writing advice. Uh. 55. Fan service is a concept you should never think about. Fans who need to be serviced are not actually fans. If you have fans, those fans are already having fun and don't need to be pandered to. <laughs> D- does her definition of fan service begin and end with, like, beach it's episodes? Just, she's just saying, no big a booby! I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat this for all the all the anime fans in my audience. Lily Orchard wants to take away your bigger booby. But again, like it needs to be said that like fan service can also be, for example, paying lip service to like a popular fandom meme or in joke. And we've done stuff like that with Less's Morgue. And I would say it's rather innocent. It's if anything, it's saying thank you to loyal fans. Not being like, you fucking asshole should be pleased with what you're getting. Eat your slop. More terrible advice. 56. The tendency for shipping to dominate discourse is the biggest sign that characters and their relationships are more satisfying than anything else. People didn't petition for a fourth season of Kim Possible to see what happened with Draken or to see new villains. I love how so 55 was don't put in fan service, and 56 is if people like their relationships, sideline the plot and give them what and, they want. And this is Rich coming from Lily Orchard, whose main complaint about Star vs. the Forces of Evil was that it turned into a shipping focused show. Yeah, 55 and 56 are literally in direct competition with each other. It was, don't you dare do fan service, and then, if fans are more interested in shipping than the plot, abandon the plot, because at the end of the day, you got to service oh your fans. God. This is, this is, this is torment. 57. Complaints about too much negativity is shooting the messenger. If there is an overabundance of negativity, that means there's something to be negative about. People cannot be positive without things to be positive about. Not writing advice. That's vague, airy that's, bullshit. That's that means just, nothing. That's just fandom and Twitter. Oh my god, I hate this. Well, and, and it's again saying, like, don't do fan service, but make sure to obey the whims of your fans. Uh, I'm getting Star Wars flashbacks. 58. If you do something bigoted and get yelled at for it, listen to the people yelling at you. Cancel culture isn't real. The rage and vitriol will be gone in two weeks, and you'll be a better person for it. Getting yelled at and... St- Getting yelled at, stop being at the end of the world, age 10. Wait, I have to read 59 in conjunction with that. 59. The quickest and easiest way to make yelling stop is to own up to the mistakes. Don't make excuses or explain why you did the bad thing. Fix it and never repeat it. Progressives are very forgiving if you give them results. Stubbornness is what gets people cancelled. This is stupid. For one reason and one reason alone. Cancel culture is not always done by progressives. And also, listen to this. Cancel culture isn't real. Getting yelled at won't be a problem for you unless you're 10. Next rule. If you want to make the yelling stop, obey the whims of your fans, or you'll get cancelled. This is so stupid. This is awful. Cancel culture is a very real thing. It like it is a phenomenon that exists. It's not exclusive to any particular group of people, but it's something we need to come to understand if we're to exist on these platforms. And you know who might help us understand? A certain YouTuber named ContraPoints, who Lily Orchard wanted to cancel! And again, the as you really... Uh, we won't get bogged down in this because it's about writing, but as you brilliantly pointed out, Gus, the right wing tries to cancel people all the fucking time. It's not just leftist infighting. Everybody tries to do this. Everybody tries to do this because it's easy. It, the, people are weaponizing this. Like, this is something that is just happening online now, and we finally have a word for it. We can't just pretend that it, e, A, doesn't exist, or B, is only done by a certain demographic of people. We need to acknowledge what we're doing, otherwise we're just gonna get black mirrored! Basically, the actual essence of what cancel culture really is, completely devoid of ideology, 
is when a mob of bad actors generally pressure the large capitalist controllers of an individual to be like, hey, look, either you drop this person or you stop getting our money. And a lot of the time, because big capitalist in institutions only give a fuck about money, they will drop that person. Damn, it's it's almost like the problem actually originates at capitalism. <laughs> yeah, anyway, moving on. Um... 60. Forced diversity is a right-wing dog whistle, not a criticism. I do completely agree with that, that generally anyone saying forced diversity is probably a right-wing asshole. But at the same time, this, what she's saying here, is often used as a defense by people who are doing bad, like, bad faith representation. Yeah, um, I I'm just gonna say, Patricia Taxon has a great video on this exact subject, and I may link that because it's so much more nuanced and better than this rule yeah go listen to her about this yes 61 reclaimed slurs are not universal and as such should never be included in a work i look i don't know what to say about this uh... the, the stupidness of that should be self-evident what's what's really funny is well obviously she is realistically probably thinking about the word queer but what she doesn't also understand is that there she's basically saying black people can't say the n-word yeah that's like that's really strange like are we gonna tell generations of hip-hop and gangster rap artists who have been telling their stories in a unique medium they pioneered and created. No, you can't use this word. Are we going to tell Spike Lee, hmm, I'm really liking this script for Malcolm X, but can we tone down this language a little because reclaimed slurs aren't universal. It, it, like, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter because uh, this is about children's cartoons and it's not about rap music, which I don't know if Lily Orchard knows are also written. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. Like, oh... 62. Oppressed people fighting against their oppressors are not villains. No, I don't care if you think they went too far. Not all of those who respond with violence are wrong, and not all of those who preach non-violence are right to do so. Yep, I agree with that. Yep. Fair enough. No, yeah. A agreement. Alright. Addendum. <laughs> Fuck the Faunus. They're stupid. Well, that's just because it's badly written. Yeah, just because it's badly written. 63. Related to the above, a good spin on the heroes who never kill mantra is to highlight how refusing to kill a villain who later goes on to kill more innocent people makes the hero responsible for those deaths. There's a free story theme for you. Mmm. Uh, Steven Universe. Yeah, it's, it's just that again, isn't it? It's just Steven Universe. Because the, the fact is, a lot of things have done that theme. But what Lily doesn't seem to get is that, like, this exact theme is often used to bolster characters who are uh, murderous, shoot first, ask questions later cops. Oh, like like they they learn from this? Well, like, like what I'm saying is like, how many characters have you seen in things that are like the Dirty Harry types who are like, I once did things by the book. I didn't extrajudicially arrest someone without extra evidence or shoot him. Oh, and then he yeah. killed somebody. So since then, I just always trust my gut and shoot people. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very Judge Dredd. Exactly, it's that exact same logic. And this is someone who claims to be anti-fascist. My goodness. Ugh. But yeah, it needs to be said, this is a staple theme of propaganda pieces. Yeah, yeah, totally. 64. If you're writing fantasy and you have no issues having dragons in your world, but suddenly think people of colour are unrealistic because something-something medieval Europe, you're a huge turd and an idiot. I agree. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah, that's true. 65. Sexual tension and chemistry are not the only indicators of a potential relationship, and in a relationship is the quickest thing to fade. Again, this so explains why she thinks uh, Charlie and Vaggie are an ideal couple. <laughs> this is just, yeah, and this is just a rule we've already heard again. Just sex bad. And it's also just like, don't ever think that Ray and Kylo had an interesting relationship. Oh, and again, more husband hotel. The best potential romantic partner for a character is her best friend. They're best friends for a reason. Lily, ha has it not also occurred to you that platonic and romantic love work on different levels? That's not, like, what are we saying? Are we saying that Wanda and Sylvia should be shipped? Like, what yeah, is like, this? It's just, again, it's just justifying, like, the best, the best uh, romantic relationships are the ones I like. So make sure to write them all like that. Again, the thing oh is, th the point is of these last couple, not to say you can't do this, just that it shouldn't be a fucking rule. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's fine to have preferences. In fact, I would go as far as to say 
all of this creative exercise is in cultivating your own taste and your own preferences and seeking out experiences that speak to you! Rule 67, I don't want X character to be defined by her relationships, is a stupid philosophy to have. Everyone is defined by their relationships. That's how human beings work. That is a bad faith rule because when people say that they mean romantic relationships and people aren't defined by their romantic relationships. Yes, and also, clearly we see Lily's bias towards, like, this very specific type of r romantic relationship the yeah. whole way, and is responding directly to the way people dis d criticize yeah. that relationship. People who have different taste. So, the, this rule exists to head off criticism as being false or subjective. Yeah, and it's in bad faith. It is in bad yeah. faith. Anyway, mm -hmm. 68. If you don't want a character to only be remembered for a romantic subplot, don't end the story on that subplot reaching its conclusion. Give it time to sink in and become the new normal for the viewer. The memorable moment will always be the last moment. I don't even know what to say yeah. about that. It, it's, it's going deeper down the same rabbit hole in a way that this isn't a useful writing tip. No, this is not... Because for this to be a useful writing tip, so many other things have to be the case. You know what's really frustrating? As a person who's seen any amount of Lily Orchard's content, all of this is stuff I already, like, knew that she believed. So, as far as I'm concerned, this is just somebody who has clearly got, like, a one-track agenda when it comes to storytelling. Just saying things that she's been saying for years, but on Twitter. That's all this is, and I'm really disappointed. 69. Nice. Uh, slow burn. Keep doing it. Shut up. Slow Thank God there's not 420 of these rules, or I'd be incorrigible. Damn. Anyway. I don't think that's my a brain writer would word. Feel free to use that one at home. <laughs> Slow burn does not mean taking forever to get together. It means full series of long romantic subplot, getting together at the start of the romantic subplot, not the end. But Lily, slow burn can also mean taking forever to get together. <laughs> it can mean anything. I, I feel like I'm infected by the slow burn sloth the longer that we yeah. talk about Lily Orchard. No, exactly. <laughs> Slowly my brain is melting out my ears. Oh my god. All right. 70. Sexual awakening is not a real character arc. Yes, it is. What the, You're the wrong. fuck it isn't? Okay, I'm sorry. Like, then really, what people's is... sexualities can be such a huge fucking part of their identity. What do you think Anna is doing in Frozen the whole time? What do you think her character arc is? It's again, it's like, but because I don't like this personal thing, I don't believe it should exist. It's, it's so stupid. Also, sexual awakening stories don't have to be like, risque they, they, they like that is just a thing that can happen to people where they come to those yeah. conclusions like emotionally and like like internally it doesn't have to include like promiscuous content it doesn't have to not either we've written a movie we've written a movie that's kind of a sexual awakening story yeah yeah it's it's perfectly fine this is weird like yeah this pivotal stage of development is not a, a like a <laughs> is not a character arc that they can be sweet and tender and coffee shoppy, just like you like, Lily. They have to already have had their sexual awakening, because how else will, from moment one of the story, they already be my fetish? Yeah, that's right, I said it. Again, go back to Husband Hotel. How will they not already have a half-hearted and underdeveloped relationship in episode one that is so vague I can impose any headcanon on it? <laughs> Might as well have named her Vagy. <laughs> <laughs> God, imagine if they did that. Help, <laughs> Wouldn't that be stupid? Help, help, help. But yeah, no, that's, again, just a horrific thing to say because that's such a huge part of so many people's lives and identities and you do not have the right to shit on that. 71. The, the only people who think boob armor makes sense are people who have not touched a boob. We've already done boob armor! We've already done it! And as well, again, I'm not defending sexualized armor, but like, and I saw this in the comments. Someone saying like... Someone just said my triple D self would be inclined to disagree. Some of us, like, need the room. <laughs> They've never touched their own boobs, clearly. They've never touched their own boobs. But, like, in all seriousness, though, like, some people legitimately just have really big boobs. Yeah. Because the thing is, it seems like, unlike Lily, you and I don't see boobs as inherently sexual things. I mean... Some people just need the space. I think, I think there's a, yeah, I think the different, the key difference here is that, like, yes, I really do like boobs, but I'm not going to tell people what to do with their boobs. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, it's just a rehash, not writing advice. Yeah. No fucking point. 
72. The bow and arrow are strength weapons, not dexterity weapons. Female characters who do archery should naturally be very physically strong. Longbows have a draw weight of 80 to 150 pounds. Rangers are always stronger than warriors. Deal with uh, it. God, Again, wow. It's just That's a, not... It's just a personal what are the? Whoa. Oh my god. What are we in right now? Are we just in really specific, like... These were supposed to be universal rules. There could have been ten of these. <laughs> We're in a cloud of brain farts. <laughs> 73. The best way to avoid tokenism is multiple characters. Yes, we said that earlier, and that would have erased a number of the other rules. Oh my god. Next. 74. Want an easy way to become more accustomed to diverse casts? Limit your straight white cis characters to one of each. Those can be three characters of each trait, or pack it all into one character, but only one of each. Or again, alternatively, just have diverse characters. Uh, okay. You, you, you don't need to play these stupid fucking mind limit, games. Limit yourself so that you can... So that you can, like... <laughs> the idea that, like, someone is going to need to, like, get an electric shock every time they do something <laughs> that that is uh, slightly yeah. traditional in terms of story. Again, what does it say about Lily that she assumes the people reading her tweets are this stupid? I think stupid? that, like, this can only mean that she needed these rules. 75. Don't be afraid of failure and backlash. If someone is screaming at you about how a character you made is racist, that is literally free writing advice that someone is just giving to you. Whoa. Look on the bright side of but, life for a change. But, but Hire a sensitivity reader. Or ask, like, a friend who you trust, who is in, like, a marginalised group that you're writing about, hey, would it be chill if you, like, ha had to read through this and just let me know if I've done anything oh stupid God. here? But again, that would require you to have a diverse selection yeah, of friends. Oh my God. 26. People of color and LGBTA people are allowed to just exist. Don't feel you have to cover bigotry just because they're in the story. In fact, people will be happier if you don't have these characters defined by suffering is itself is a tired trope. Yep. Yeah, fair enough. 77. I just want my readers slash viewers to have fun is an excellent attitude hit to have when it comes to storytelling. And I, and I don't know that Lily believes in this, but moving on. I mean, sometimes, like with Hereditary, a great piece of art, you want to put your people through the fucking ringer. It depends yeah, on the story yeah, you're telling. Yeah, okay. 78. As a general rule, Slice of Life has always been a more popular genre than action slash adventure. Shut up! Again with this? Like, again, just... Ross and Rachel's terrible, but Friends is better than any anime! Yeah, it, it, it's literally just... Make everything a bullshit, no conflict, no sex, no violence, fucking coffee this, shop uh, AU, where everyone is wearing gloves and holding hands in a hypoallergenic bubble tea bar. This is just, like, no wonder Lily Orchard started with My Little Pony and was so disappointed in Steven Universe, because Steven Universe could have been this show, like, could have been the show that Lily Orchard's describing, but decided to go somewhere else, which, by the way, I, you know, everyone knows how I feel about Steven Universe. Let's not go there. <laughs> 79. Feature creep is a problem in storytelling as well. You don't have to cram every single idea, reference, and homage you can think of into a story. You can save ideas for another time. Yep, yep I agree Fair. with that. 80. D&D &D alignments are terrible metrics for character design. They're meant as a quick reference for improvisation in a tabletop role-playing game environment, and shouldn't be taken outside of that environment. The, the, yeah, they can. They can, yeah. yeah like, like, <laughs> like, they shouldn't be used... Even at the D&D &D table, they're not the yeah, entire like, basis. They, they shouldn't be the end. They shouldn't be the end of your character development, but you can sure as fuck Rule use them. Rule number one, don't write shallow characters. Rule number two, that's... No, we're done. That's the only good advice. 81. When writing LGBTA characters, stay as far away from Rocky Horror Picture Show as you possibly can. Some gay people hold it up as a meaningful part of our culture. It is not. It's a transmisogynistic nightmare made by an actual turf. Not a reference guide for anything. Fact is, I've not seen this movie, and I don't think I tick the right boxes to be able to comment on it even if I had. But it seems like a matter of opinion. Yeah, Shall I think we move let's on? not talk about it, but also... Uh, just bringing up specific works again has no place on this list. It's like the Infinity Train thing. Exactly. 82. The Q slur as a concept tacitly reinforces heteronormativity by casting LGBTA people as inherently strange. In no big deal representation, the word should be avoided. Normalizing LGBTA people and the Q slur are like oil and water and don't, don't go together. Again, I think it's worth having context. You can probably see this on the screen right now, but, uh... The fact that that has 20 likes and 43 replies mm. 
probably tells you what you need to, to know about that one. That's just, we've heard this. We've heard it before, Lily. Yeah, again, yeah, we've, we've done this dance before and it was boring yeah. the first time. Rule 83, rape is an unforgivable crime, much more so than killing. Killing can potentially be justified in a story without becoming a villain. Rape cannot. Agreed. Yep. Moving on. <laughs> 84. Sex scenes are never necessary. You want to include one just because if you want to include one just because you're horny, then more power to you. But any attempt to justify it as important to the story will get you laughed at. Again, objectively that's, wrong. It's just sex shaming. Yeah, that's not that's not true at all. Anything that any human being can do can be a part of a story. This is this rule. If you take out the weird sex shaminess, this this is the rule of never show a character go to the bathroom ever. It doesn't belong in the story. Yeah, no, exactly. Meg pointed this out earlier. Um, I believe it was Roger Ebert who said something like, well, in a sense, you could, if you wanted to be super reductive, say that all human action presented in movies is unnecessary because these fictional characters aren't bound by the same rules as, like, actual humans. But, like... It's so just... I balk at the criticism that, like sex scenes only exist in stories because the author was horny. Yeah, no, that's just such a... Again, this is a person who only watches children's cartoons, movies owned by Disney, and the odd video game. This is this person's only frame of reference. I, I, like, I'm tempted to call projection at a certain point. <laughs> yeah, no, genuinely, I think this is someone who is just kind of a slut shamer in real life, or at the very least a sex shamer. Just applying those same things to, oh, you have sex, you're disgusting. Like, I identify as uh, ace, asexual, mm -hmm. but I personally think, like, I wholeheartedly reject other ace people who uh, like to normalize sex shaming, even as a joke. Because when you sex shame, you are sex shaming um, queer people. Sorry, you are sex shaming not straight people. That better for you, Lily? But yeah, you are sex shaming all those. You are sex shaming um, women. You are sex shaming sexual assault survivors who are trying to reclaim their sexuality, for whom reclaiming sexual agency is a huge fucking deal for them. Like, you don't get to say all of this is only ever in stories because it makes the author horny. That is a pathetic and childish way to engage with And that. I will say, too, that you practice what you preach because... Uh, you've written a lot of stories with sex scenes in them. And, like, I've co-written uh, our, our feature script with you that features a number of sex yeah. scenes. But you were the one who came up with the original premise of that. And, like, you know, it's it wasn't just, like, like as soon as you brought the, the uh, straight heterosexual male in that, you know, suddenly the script got horny. It was a horny premise that I helped write. No, exactly. Because, yeah, like I said, I'm an ace guy. And I've written a shitload of sex scenes and things, and you know why? Because they had narrative utility, not because they made me Well, horny. there you go. Anyway, moving on. 85. Strong characters can still cry and need support from others. Vulnerability is not a character This is flaw. just the other rule. This I is don't... just a repeat of the other rule with, with women. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, and again, and I, I don't think anyone is saying this no. either. No. Like, no one who is not a fucking chudmeister anyway is saying this. Yeah, only this. dumb people say this. Only people who put, like, the crying ray in their thumbnail and go, like, this strong guy. Like, only those people. No, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, th and those people are beyond help anyway. 86. Peak TV is a fancy way of saying addiction-fueled misery porn. Not writing not advice. Not writing advice. Just a That's screed. nothing. Yep. Moving on. 87. Addiction-based storytelling <laughs> relies on serialization, cliffhangers, shocking twists, constantly raised stakes, and an obsession with foreshadowing to get people to watch. <laughs> Not because they're enjoying themselves, but because they're stuck on attention. <laughs> I, I agree with this one. This might be actually why I got into Lily's work in the first place, because... But, but here's the thing, here's the thing. There are good and bad ways to do that. What this sounds like to me is this moment in Peep Show where Super Hands, who is one of the characters who runs a band <laughs> with another character called Jeremy, they're sitting in the office of a music producer and he turns around and he says, you can't trust these producer types. All they want to do is give you a nice big advance on your work, promote and distribute your stuff and make a profit for you and them. I think, okay, I we, we can move on after this, but I think this is the thing, this is the core of why 
I found Lily Orchard's work so fascinating in the past. And it's also like something that I've been trying to say better than she ever could. But you know now that when she says this, she's not saying what you're saying. You know that basically when she's saying this, based on the context from the other rules, what she's saying is everything needs to be a coffee shop at well, you. And she's also saying the people who want something else are addicts, which again, she's stigmatizing actual drug addicts through this. Oh, and by the way, next one, 87 part two. By the end, the viewer is only watching for closure because they've already invested so much and they need to fix and they need their fix in order to feel like it was worth it. This is the same business model soap operas use. Well, yeah, Lily, in bad iterations of this, but good dramas use those same tactics and they're great. This this to me just seems like she's upset that any story wouldn't doesn't conclude or that has something it's building towards. Oh man, this is rough. To me, to me the way she's presenting this is like saying hammers are bad because you can beat someone to death with a hammer, not knowing that like you can also build a house or put up some shelves I don't with know. them. It's all in how this incredibly neutral tool Magnifying is used. Magnifying glasses, you can burn ants with them. I don't like them. I don't use them. Exactly. 88. If the sunk cost fallacy didn't exist, shows like Steven Universe and Game of Thrones would have been cancelled by season two. Get <laughs> over it. Don't! Stop! They're over! Jesus They're fucking, over! Like, watch something else, you fucking loser. Oh I'm sorry, I know this no, is no, ad no, hominem, no. but like... I, I, think that, I think that that's warranted because... Because we need to stop talking. Collectively, we need to stop talking about Steven Universe and Game of Thrones. We all need to shut up about it forever. Yeah, it's been over a year since Game of Thrones ended. And if not over a year, coming up on a year since Steven Universe future ended. So just shut the yeah, fuck I up. Want us to, I want us to move on because I care. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. This would be like, oh, you know... That I, I had some real issues with Charlie Chaplin's modern times. Like Lily is just the person who's like, I fucking hate this dead horse. I fucking hate this stupid dead horse. Yeah. It's like, Lily, just bury the no, horse. Exactly. And let's be honest, she keeps talking about it because the only thing anyone knows her fucking channel from is the fact that she did that video about Steven Universe. Yeah, 100%. Well, there was the Legend of Korra one before that, so hi yeah, yeah. 89. Hardcore fans will tell you that continuity is the most important thing. They're wrong. But Lily, it is it's, an important it's, yeah, thing. Yeah, it's not, like, I think she's just arguing about, like, vaguely, like, expanded universe Star Wars people. Like, what a stupid thing to say as a writing rule, because continuity just means, if you repeatedly change the continuity, you are punishing fans for paying attention. 90. Okay. This is too political is a complaint only made by conservatives when a story acknowledges that non-white and non-straight people exist. The existence of other kinds of people is not political. Enjo ignore these complaints. Not writing advice. Mm. 91. The Little Mermaid and Cinderella are more feminist than Beauty and the Beast. That's not! Oh my god! Not writing Shut up, Jordan Peterson! <laughs> 92. If you want to know when to change a trans character's pronouns in the narration, doing so at the moment when they realise who they are and admit it to themselves out loud is chef's kiss. That's fine. That's I don't have are, anything yeah, to say about really that. Close. Not trans. No comment. Uh, 93. As long as it isn't harmful or bigoted, you don't have to justify any, distor any story decisions made on the basis of self-indulgence. Except for sex scenes. You... Except for sex scenes because you can't. Yeah. they can't advance the narrative. <laughs> except, for <self> <laughs> except for sex scenes and booby armor. Oh my god. So stupid. What a bunch of shit. What a load. 94. Vampires slash werewolves are not inherently LGBTA coded, and doing so is an example of othering. They work better as metaphors for aristocracy and predators, respectively, than as the underclass. Never use these two fictional legendary archetypes for anything other than the themes I yeah, want them to never. mean. Yeah, never. Even though these are both incredibly, like 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 well used story tropes and could represent almost anything given the right story never do it don't i mean the the, the number of things where like monsterization has been used as a metaphor for like puberty and coming of age from fucking teen wolf to ginger snaps like now nah, throw that all out the fucking window yeah just like, just just don't ever uh, they 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 are only vampires used as a metaphor for addiction in being human stuff like that like no yeah, yeah o only use them as aristocracy and predators, as though the aristocracy is a fucking salient thing to be making comments on in the year of our Lord 2020. Oh my god. <laughs> 95. Some of the best stories ever were written as an act of spite. I agree. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> Some of the best Twitter comment threads were not. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 96. Any, any system of government, with the exception of fascism, can exist in a positive or negative context. Monarchies are not always inherently evil, see Hawaii pre-annexation, and democracies are not always inherently good, see USA. Right this accordingly. is dangerous! And also too politically yeah. charged to even get into because I don't know what they're even saying. Yeah, this is just like, can't touch it. Don't have the time or the knowledge. 97. Lesbian is still on good terms with boyfriend from before coming out. It's a really cute friendship trope. And vice versa. I mean, I guess that's a tip. Yeah. D don't know what the fuck I should take from that, but okay. Write this thing I like <laughs> seeing. 98. 98. The only real difference between an extremely close platonic relationship and a romantic relationship is what the people involved choose to call it. Best friends are not something that should ever be prefixed with the word just. Again, that's such a highly subjective thing. Yeah, that doesn't thing. work for everybody. And it's just... Like, that's not... Yeah, it, it's no. not... Like, again, if that is how you and your, like, partners and friends perceive it, yeah, fine and but, dandy. but... Like, but not everyone has to think like you. Romantic relationships, it's really, really complicated. There's not just one way to do it. There's so many other... And, and the fact that Lily would spend so much time in this, you know, talking about LGBT people, and then it has to, like, reach a certain conclusion, no matter what, just shows that, like, it, it's really not about being open-minded. It's about adhering to the specific way that Lily likes relationships. I guarantee you, if um, if Lily was a different person with this same framework, like, they would be writing stories in which, like, whatever their sexuality and ethnicity was, was the right way to go. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, the, the reality is, I think something we've learned throughout this whole thing, and an important message for everyone at home, both in writing and in life, is that... If your only fucking reference point for relationships is children's cartoons, you are going to have an extremely blunt, binary, reductive, and frankly silly and childish perspective on the incredibly nuanced minefield that is human relationships. Yeah, yeah. Like, the reality is, not just watch and read other things, but be a fucking person. Also, not writing advice. Yes. 99. Normalized friends saying, I love you to each other. Not really writing That's advice. That's not writing advice. Like, oh wait, let's do this. I love you, man. 100. 100. Yeah, I love you too. <laughs> if you write a 100... Are you happy now, Lily? You can't do that mean video. We're about normalizing. Yeah, now. yeah, because we say, we say that we love each other. <sighs> Anyway, if if you write a 100 tweet long thread of writing advice, you are a huge loser with way way too much free time on your hand. Get back to work and do something productive with your life. Yeah, like make like yeah, like making angry YouTube videos. See Lily. that tweet at the end. See, no, the thing is, that's no! the final tweet. Other than the last, the, the one tweet after that is tips and rules are two different words. But that thing, which is a perfect thing to end on, that might be a funny and ironic statement. If Lily did literally anything other than this in her life. Oh my god, Lily, this is just a rehash of all your videos, but it's all the takes that didn't take with people. So you're putting it on Twitter, the worst place to express any idea. Ah! And then yeah. you're gonna be at the end like none of this was this was all a social experiment. It didn't matter. None of these rules mattered. Like I, the whole time. I, yeah, well, listen, folks what that at home, is, is, what that is, is, I'm <laughs> hanging a lamp. <laughs> I've been saying the whole time, there's no stone. Don't worry about the etchings on other people's stones. There's nothing. There's nothing but your own frame of reference. Everybody is trapped within their own mind, their own perspective, and our minds contain a multitude of ideas, a whole universe even. So in order to like boil down the, the, the barest, like sort of like zeroed in, uh, 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 uh laser focused, um, element of our taste, we have to continue to consume. We have to continue to experience things. But that's not universal. The rest is communication. You have to talk to other people. You can't just use yourself as a backup. You have to be able to relate to what other people's ideas are and what they came to and their conclusions. And you have to be like, that's valid. Or can we talk about that? Because I think you came to some weird conclusions. Yeah, no, exactly. And ultimately, all that last tweet is, all that is, is... Hanging a lampshade on it, 
So if videos like the one we're currently recording and that you're currently watching ever come out, she can inevitably go, lol, look how butthurt these guys were about this. I wasn't even taking it seriously. You guys are the idiots here. I relish it. I relish that moment. Come and get us. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Basically, what we've come down to is, thank God Lily Orchard isn't a real writer beyond lame <laughs> fanfics and contrarian YouTube videos because she would oh produce God. the most boring anodyne coffee shop AU shit you have ever seen. I can't believe how I can't believe how calm and like open minded I started this video. I can't believe it compared to like how I feel at this moment with like you broke it you broke me Lily you did it you broke me we, we have watched a man go from, look, I disagree with her on a lot of things, and she's like a contentious figure, but I respect her, to, what a fucking moron. <laughs> <laughs> with a, with a, you, like, because it's literally, it, it went from like, you know, there's some interesting things to be gleaned from the work of Lily Orchard, to, this person is exactly the problem with YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Now, this person is exactly the problem with the way people consume art. If you follow, like, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there are some good nuggets in here, and we've given credit to those. But right. those yeah, good exactly. nuggets were, A, things that almost fucking anyone who isn't a bigoted asshole would tell you, and two, if you're an aspiring writer up there, and you followed all of these rules, what you would write, the result would be crap. Yeah, the result would be a contradictory, redundant mess that doesn't make any sense, and is also done purely to fill the fill a void that that was left by some shows that don't even matter the best of which is probably a seven out of ten yeah and i think what i really want to end this video with and you can bring this up as a graphic is a pie chart because the great thing with 100 tweets is we'll knock off the last one uh yeah. <laughs> with this pie chart out of 100 percent, we can have the portion that is actual tips the portion the, the actual tips that aren't contradicted by other tips the portion that is a screed and the portion that is contradictory subjective nonsense. <laughs> and I bet that will be a nasty looking chart. Oh boy, I can see it right now. It's 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 hell, Henry. And it, it's yeah, hell. It's hell. And again, and again. If you think, you know, if you're one of those people who are like if you've made it this far in, awesome, great. You've given Gus's channel some wonderful watch time bonuses. The algorithm will love it. But if you're one of those people who are like, oh, yeah, well, let's see you do better. So we've already done better with the advice on here. But as we said at the start of the video, you are welcome to check out the shit we've written and see us do better. Less is more. Link will be in the description. Go check it out. Gus and I are a huge part of the planning and writing of that series. We've done fucking voices in it and shit. Like we put our money where our mouth is. It's a great show, and it won't be our last, because when it comes to creativity, the only place to go is up. You know, you can wallow in spitefully trying to will the world into giving you what you want from it yeah. in terms of storytelling, or you can, with your own two hands, or, you know, with your own keyboard, or, like, with anything you have at your disposal, be a part of something bigger than yourself and create something that people can truly enjoy. Because that's what it's all about, baby! Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's the thing we want you to ask yourself as we end this video. Do you want to be the kind of person who made a great piece of art that speaks to you and speaks to people like you? Or do you want to be the person who, to this day, is still clearly so insanely upset about Steven Universe and She-Ra and all that stuff that you just cannot fucking get over it? And what an incredibly sad existence it is to be some fucking has-been whose whole existence is just ranting about shows that are already over. Damn, damn, dude. Damn, dude. I think you just dug 12 feet. Yeah. The grave was already 6 feet, but you dug down even further. Thanks for watching, everybody. This has been Two Professional Writers React to Lily Orchard's writing advice. <laughs> Adios, friends. Check out Lessons Morgue. Bye.